Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely John, where we talk about literature and sometimes art and sometimes the humanities in general. But today we are doing a classic straight talking to the camera about literature. And I have my notes with me as always. Um, and we're going to be talking about a, um, not a Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale, but a Grimm's brother fairy tale called The Goose Girl, which I'm, I'm really, really excited to talk about and analyze with you guys. So one of the things that you notice about the story of The Goose Girl is that it has many of the same sort of archetypes and tropes that we see in a lot of fairy tales. The structure is very similar. Um, one of those things is that she has no father. Oftentimes being completely orphaned or at least lacking one parent is key to the main character. We see that it starts off with her journeying to her betrothed. She has a charm of her mother's hair, which is representative of this parental protection that's going to, you know, hopefully oversee her she makes this journey and then we also have this magical element of this talking horse and one of the things that i really enjoy about fairy tales that i think we don't often see in maybe fantasy stories is that the magic feels no obligation to justify itself or justify its existence or to make sense in any sense of reality at all and i think this is where like fairy tales seem and feel dreamlike. The rest of the story is quite normal except for this element of this talking horse and then we'll see a, a little bit later a few other like inexplicable magic elements but otherwise the whole world is quite normal and there's no other sense of supernatural power or intervention. The magical charm will be done away with very early in the story and she will have to depend, this main character, this princess, on her own wits or merit. Um, we see that the maid that is sent with her is very difficult and strong-willed. The princess really has to toughen herself up to be able to make it in the world without this parental protection. And there's this real tension in this story between the character, this sort of like prescriptivist way in which they kind of talk about the character that this princess needs to develop. On the surface level, we talk about these ideals of femininity being meek and mild and gentle. And, um, you know, that's kind of like the surface level explicit discussion of femininity. But what we really see happening sort of if you dig a little bit deeper into the narrative, it actually the princess needs to get some teeth to be successful. The maid has some teeth. She's got some grit. She's got some strength to her. And that's what allows her to succeed in the world. Um, she happens to also be dishonest, which we'll see will be her downfall. So the story isn't necessarily advocating that you be a big fat liar or be unethical or evil to be successful, but it does say that you need to be strong. And so we're really trying to navigate this definition of goodness that is not also weakness. We also have this disruption of power and authority. And this happens a lot like in Shakespeare's place where you have this sort of like topsy-turvy hierarchy in the middle, especially with comedies. And then things have to get sort of straightened out and the couples get back together. And then, you know, the hierarchy and the unity is restored in the kingdom and the land and in the story. And this is something that we're gonna see in this story as well. Uh, and the resolution is that, again, you have to put things back into order. So there's a dissolution or there's a disruption in the hierarchy while um, things are being remade. There's a transformative period in the middle, but it does organize itself back into, um, you know, a, a power structure at the end of the day. So as mentioned, she does lose her mother's locks of hair. And it's like it's both an emancipation from her parents, but it's also like a, a loss to her as well, obviously. So her mother's luck was there to give this sort of like supernatural protection, but also these moments of advice and that sort of thing. But it also gives her the opportunity to become an adult. So it's kind of like a mixed bag, if you will. There are good elements to it and there are difficulties that she's gonna have to face as a result of it. Whoops, wrong way. Once the princess, now arriving in the garb of the maid and the maid arriving in the garb of the princess, arrive at this new kingdom to meet her betrothed, we see that the 
king, the father king here, is able to recognize the signs of inner identity where the prince is not able to. The king sort of goes, wow, that's really interesting that her maid has such a noble bearing and such a noble presentation to herself. She's such an elegant woman, whereas the prince just sort of immediately assumes reality based on its face value. And here we see sort of this idea that there is embedded wisdom in the older generations. We also can note now that the characters are all archetypes. They don't really have names. They are just the prince, the maid, the false bride, the king, the princess, except for the talking horse, this one stray magical element. He has a name, Fulata. He's killed <laughs> and the true princess cries. And so we see something very, very similar to some biblical stories starting to come into this thread, this narrative. And this is often the case for a lot of Western literature to say that it was not influenced by the Bible would be silly. And so fairy tales, which were often much older than the time that the Christian faith maybe came in and interwoven to culture, we see some of these sort of threads coming through and kind of braiding into this tapestry, if you will. So this element of the story where Falada the horse gets killed uh, on the commands of the false princess, the false bride, and the true princess crying over it very much reminds me of the st famous story of Solomon, which is given as a sort of exemplar of his wisdom. And if you're not familiar, the story goes that one woman is accusing another woman of stealing her baby and the other woman is sort of accusing it back like, oh, she's lying about this just so she can steal my baby. And so the ruling that Solomon gives is that he says, well, let's cut the baby in half and you can each have half a baby. And the woman whose baby it isn't is like, sure, go ahead. Good ruling. Great job. Do that. And the woman whose baby it is immediately starts crying and says, don't cut the baby in half. She can have it. Just whatever you do, don't kill my baby. And that sort of reveals the inner heart, the truth of what's going on. And by that means, Solomon is able to figure out whose baby it is. And that's kind of what we see going on here. Again, we have these little moments that seem kind of random, but what they're actually doing is sort of like saying, what is the truth underneath the lie? Uh, a true princess has pure gold locks, of course, uh, this, you know, emblem of amazing beauty. And we see, again, the sense of authority and power with her, even supernatural authority, comes through in the way that she's able to command the wind. She has this power, she has this authority, and it's also revelatory of who her true identity is. The true princess can only resume her proper position when she tells the truth. This is really important for a mythic, on a mythic level. I think I was talking about this recently with my brother on the topic of Odin and his um, ability to read and write runes. And this goes back to like a key element in creation stories, even in the Genesis story, we have God speaking the world into existence. So this idea of speaking truth becomes very, very iconic in some of our oldest, oldest stories. And it's true in this, uh, this fairy tale as well. So, but by the rules of the story, her life is at stake. So, you know, I think it feels very light and silly as an outsider reading the story, but remember that her life really is threatened by the rules of this narrative. So she has, you know, she definitely has good reasons for not wanting to tell the truth. Uh, telling the truth can be risky as, you know, being vulnerable with people, telling people how you actually feel, speaking the truth when you know that it's probably going to hurt someone that you love and being able to do that in a gentle way. These are all ways in which like speaking the truth has risks associated with it. And that's what this story is getting at in this moment as well. But it's the only way to defeat bullies, to defeat evil and to defeat deceivers. Then once she speaks the truth, her true identity and the revelation of her truth, like just is on full display. And we see that again through this idea of her beauty being a revolution, revelation of her true identity. So she puts on a beautiful dress and she's so beautiful. She's just like outshining the false princess and the false princess in her deception and her plot to deceive is deceived herself. She has no ability to perceive how much she's being outshone by the true princess, which I think is often a, uh, I guess a truism that's explored in fairy tales as well. And then we have her, the false prison princess is given the power of judgment, but she doesn't know that she's actually casting that judgment back on herself. So she's given the opportunity to say, okay, well, what should happen? Should 
this scenario happen. This woman is claiming to be the real princess, but she's obviously lying. So what should happen to such a woman who lies about her identity? And the false princess, of course, says, oh, she should be, you know, completely, uh, you know, I don't remember what the, how the story ends because it's been a while, but she, I think she asks her to be like beheaded and killed possibly worse but anyway it's this horrible really really heavy heavy judgment that she casts upon uh, such a woman who would lie about her identity as a princess and we see this happening again in biblical narratives over and over again particularly i'm thinking of the david and bathsheba story the prophet nathan confronts david about basically causing bathsheba's husband to be killed on the battlefront. He sends him to the front of the battle to be killed because David is really in love with Bathsheba and he's already seduced her and had an affair with her. So now he's killing her husband, trying to get his husband out of the way so that he can actually take her as a, another wife for him. And Nathan confronts him on this under this sort of like parallel situation. He says like, oh, there's a shepherd who has a ton of sheep, i.e. wives, you, David. And then there's the shepherd who has only one sheep, i.e. Bathsheba's husband, I forget his name. And um, he says, what would you do to the shepherd who goes and kills the shepherd who has one sheep to take his one sheep when he already has a ton? Of course, David gets enraged. Such injustice, who could do such a thing? And Nathan goes, that's you, David. That's what you did with Bathsheba's husband. And this is what you did Beth to get Bathsheba, even though you've already been blessed with many wives and all this stuff. And so what we see in this story, both in the Goose Girl and the story in the Bible, is that we are blind to our own faults all the time. And there's also this contrast that's set up in the Bible between this principle of very harsh, militaristic, heavy judgment, always sticking to the letter of the law. <laughs> My dog is napping right here and he's having dreams. But this idea of like, what the cost is of heavy judgment. So like, yes, there is a certain level of justice and the way that the goose girl ends is that the judgment that the go that the false princess announces is what falls on her. So they do actually like follow through with like cutting her head off and she dies and blah, blah, blah. Um, but the Bible takes a different spin on it. And so it says that the, everyone falls short of the glory of God, right? So everybody is worthy of judgment from God's perspective. And if that's true, then everyone would just die. And what kind of world is that? So there has to be some alternative answer to it. And as we see like in James with this idea that mercy triumphs over justice, we see that even though like, yes, you can stick to the letter of the law all day long, but you will fall, you will die by that. You will die by that role eventually because we're all imperfect. Les Miserables, that, that's the story of Javert, right? He's this strict, strict person. And by the time he gets to the point where he actually offers grace to somebody else, he cannot get past it. So he commits suicide at the end. Spoilers, but it's a really old book. So get over yourselves. And so that's where the idea that, you know, mercy triumphs over justice because the law killeth. We see this sort of theology even in the Lord's Prayer that there's this idea of like the more generously you can forgive, the more graciously you can forgive, the bigger the debt you can forgive, the more in line you are actually with what God is trying to do in the world. So there's a line in the Lord prayer, pray, Lord's Prayer that says, forgive me my debts as I forgive my debtors. And so there's this comparative sense there, right? And we have another parable from Jesus where he talks about the debtor who was forgiven like a small amount versus the debtor that was forgiven a large amount. Which one of these is going to be more grateful? And all of this is done on the backdrop of the fact that in Christian theology, Jesus died for us. And so when we as humans go around thinking about the hurts that other people have caused us, the injustices that other people have done against us, we're always supposed to sort of like measure it against the injustice that we've done against God himself and his willingness to forgive us. So that's how much we should be willing to forgive other people. And I think that biblical framework that biblical view of justice and then mercy relative to justice is at the foundation of the conclusion of this story and is at the foundation of what they're talking about when they give the power of judgment to the princess and that judgment falls back on her. 
So <laughs> that is what I have for you guys today. I'm sorry that my chair is squeaky. It's, it's where I'm at. It's a $60 chair from Amazon. So, and I sit in it every day cause I work from home from due to COVID. So it's, it's working hard for us. Anyway, if you have any thoughts, questions, or other ideas to add to this story and my interpretation of it, I hope that you will leave it in the comments below. Until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile.